different reads. For the walking, there is one word, and it is common, koinon cosmon, but when a man sleep, each one turns aside into a private word, idion cosmon. The Swiss psychiatrist Ludwig Biswanger interprets the dichotomy between the idiosyncratic dimension of sleep and the common wakeful world, accessible to all, to which Heraclitus points, in terms of a different gradation of perception and of communicability of what is perceived. Biswanger adopts the expression oneric experience to underline that also while dreaming we undergo sensas sensorial experiences, arguing that the dream is a form of existence, a particular modality of being a man, not separated from the sphere of wakefulness. Commenting on the same Heraclitean fragment, Michel Foucault argues that it, uh, in its anthropological significance, the history of the dream teaches us that the dream both reveals the world in its transcendence and modulates the world in its substance, playing on its material character. In other words, dreaming is an experience that transcends the reality we know, and yet it reveals meaningful aspects of our human nature in our historical existence. The dream phenomenon is expression of individual dreamers but also of the wider cultural context to which they belong. <coughs> this is particularly true for the pre-modern world, when dreams were highly regarded on both a private and social level, often being considered the dream messages from the non-human world, from God, the gods, the angels, demons, or the deceased people. To some extent, we can argue that oneric fragments shaped the social consciousness of the ancient world. Whether institutionalized in official cults or deep-rooted in pri private religiosity, oneric rituals were deeply interwoven in the religious experience of the individual and the community. Therefore, evidence on dreams and on the different behavioral attitudes they have determined often turns out to be highly valuable for reconstructing the religious beliefs and social history of the ancients. Dream reports and sources on oneric ritual practice might be exploited to trace the mediation between the individual and the community, as well as the interaction of different cultural groups in antiquity. In this presentation, I wish to broaden this second aspect, exploring the religious encounter between the Jews and their neighbors in relation to oneric magic that is, magical and divinatory rituals, including within their structure, a specific stage of dreaming, or aimed at interfering with the natural activity of dreaming and sleeping. References to dreams and oneric behaviors are scattered through Jewish literature since the Bible, and the practice of oneric magic is attested to within Jewish culture, at least from late antiquity. To the category of Jewish oneric magic belong, for instance, the Hatavat Chalom, a practice aimed at reversing a bad dream, and the Shelat Chalom, a technique aimed at obtaining hidden information in a dream. In this lecture, however, I will focus on oneric magical techniques exhibiting an explicit aggressive character that is aimed at causing sleeping impairments such as insomnia or nightmares in a third party. I will start by discussing a recipe for causing insomnia preserved in Sefer Arazim, and I will then compare it with other Jewish and non-Jewish oneric aggressive <coughs> texts. It is my hope that through this brief excursus, I can relate to you the potential of sources on dreams and dream behaviors in the, richer, in the research of ancient cultures and in the comparative study of religions. Sefer Arazim represents one of the most ancient and famous, and famous literary books of magic in Jewish culture. Probably written by a Jewish writer towards the middle of the first millennium of the Common Era, in Palestine or Egypt, Sefer Arazim is highly in depth to Greek-Egyptian magical lore. Among the 28 magical recipes for different purposes preserved in the book, there is also an oneric aggressive recipe aimed at wielding a certain power on individuals by operating on their sleeping and dreaming behavior. In reading and commenting this text, I follow the lecture preserved on the 10th century fragment that you see. 
on the screen, uh, which is from the Cairo Geniza. And uh, this is uh, source one uh, in the handle. <coughs> the text uh, starts uh, with uh, um, the introductory expression, if you want to make your enemy sleep disturbed, which functions as the title of the recipe. The specific oneric aggressive goal is expli explicitly stated later on in the text. And I quote, and do not give sleep, neither light sleep, uh, nor deep sleep to his eyelids. And as we will soon see, it seems to correspond to the psychophysical impairment known in contemporary medicine as insomnia. After the title, the recipe indicates a first series of instructions aimed at directing the user in the selection of the materia magica. And I quote from the recipe, take the head of a black dog that never saw light during its days and take lead from the cold water pipe and make a lamella. The first required element for the spell is the head of a dog, probably a puppy born that dead or a fetus, which according to some of the lecciones had to be black. While the use of a dog is not attested elsewhere in Sefer Arazim, dead dogs and canine organic material uh, are uh, listed among the common magical ingredients registered in the corpus of the Greek and Demotic magical papyri. The second material required in the magical ritual is a metallic su surface, either a foil <coughs> or a tablet, according to the different lecciones, on which to engrave the magical names and the spell. All the manuscripts report an incomprehensible corrupted word, in the fragment that we are reading uh, is uh, written psuchotron, which is probably derived from the Greek term psuchophoron. This term occurs, in fact, in expressions such as a cold water pipe, Psuchroforu solones, a cold water system, Psuchroforu topu, and a tablet made out of cold water pipe, top Psuchroforon petalon, respect, respectively documented in two magical spells from the Greek magical papyri and in a Roman defixio. All these magical texts attest to the custom of scraping lead from the pipes of an aqueduct or any other water systems in order to produce a lead lamella and to subsequently inscribe it during the ritual practice. After the description of the materia magica, the recipe in Sefer Arazim instructs the user to inscribe the lamella with an invocation to the angels. And I read, O angels of the world who stand in the fourth encampment, to you I consign the life, the soul, and the spirit of N, son of N, and here the user had to uh, put his name, so that you bind him in iron chains and tie him in copper rods, and do not give sleep, nor light sleep, nor deep sleep to his eyelids, and he will cry and scream like a parturian, and do not give the permission to release him from the ties of the spell to any other man except from me. The juxtaposition of the specific terms Shena, Tnuma, and Tardema emphasizes the condition of, of absolute resentlessness brought, out, brought about by the curse. The recipe aims at harming the victim in his er entire persona, as it is suggested by the conjunct <coughs> use of the terms Nefesh, Nishama, and Ruach. The pain wished for the victim is very intense and it is compared to that suffered in childhood. In other manuscripts transmitting this passage, the victim is also compared to a barking dog, the Yenover Kekele. In the recipe, the invocation ends with a command to the angels to prevent anyone else beside the user from releasing the victim as wielding complete power over the victim and nullifying any counter spell intending to break, to break the first incantation. <coughs> Afterwards, the recipe continues with further ritual instruction. And I read from the text. <coughs> and write the invocation <coughs> above and put the inscribed lamella in the mouth of the dog and put wax on the mouth and seal it with a ring which has a lion engraved upon it. And go and hide it uh, behind his house or in a place in which he goes out and enters. According to the logic of sympathetic magic, 
the head of a dog symbolizes the head of the victim. The insertion of the lamella upon which the curse is inscribed into the head of the dog figuratively represents the entrance of fury and madness into the head of the chosen victim, and therefore brings about the sleep disorder. As long as the lamella is in the dog's head, the victim is granted no rest at all. The detail that the dog's mouth has to be hermetically sealed with wax <coughs> refers to the indissolubility of the course, which can be broken only by the user who activated it. The last section of the recipe contains instructions for releasing the victim from the spell and some general purity rules that need to be observed for the success of the incantation. <coughs> The recipe we have just read corresponds in all respects to an oneric aggressive magical procedure that aims to harm a certain victim using sleep disorders. Although the Hebrew text does not employ a technical form, a technical term for insomnia, it clearly refers to the specific sleep disturbance. According to the text, the impossibility of experiencing sleep, light sleep or deep sleep that is, an extended phase of insomnia, is a curse dreadful enough to be sent to an enemy. Although the recipe does not specify why the enemy is inflicted with insomnia, the final clause regarding the release of the victim <coughs> might indicate that the user employs insomnia to blackmail the victim about a certain issue. Whatever reason drove users to punish or threaten their enemies with lack of sleep, the recipe in Sefer Arazim demonstrates that the specific sleep impairment was regarded as an annoying and dangerous condition, difficult to endure, especially when protracted over a long period. The recipe from Sefer Arazim is not the only Jewish magical text implying that a healthy life demands physiological sleep. There are, in fact, a few medieval Jewish magical recipes aimed at restoring someone's sleep. To give you an example, I will read a recipe for this purpose preserved on a published 11th century fragment from the Cairo Geniza, which is source 2 in the handout. And you can see the uh, fragment on the screen. So I, I read from the text. For sleep, when a person cannot sleep, Healing from heaven in the name of, and here we have a series of uh, angelic names, you are the holy angels who are appointed to the indulgence of sleep. Bring sleep of good life to N, son of N, quickly. Amen, amen, Selah. And the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon N, son of N, and he slept and dreamed, and he liked it. Despite the passage in Sefer Arazim, the Geniza recipe does not bear an aggressive character. In particular, the text does not mention whether the user's sleeplessness has to be imputed to a demonic or human magical activity. Both texts, however, reflect the belief that specific angels control the sleeping faculties of men. Angels appointed, appointed to the indulgence of sleep in the Geniza recipe and angels in charge of preventing human beings from natural rest in Sefer Arazim. While the Geniza recipe seems to exhibit a Jewish character, especially marked by the use of the biblical verses from the book of Genesis, the recipe in Sefer Arazim shows outstanding similarities with non-Jewish late antique magical texts, and in particular, turns out to be largely in debt to Greek-Egyptian magic. Therefore, I would like to compare it to a few Greek-Egyptian and Greco-Roman magical texts for similar purposes, in order to highlight how foreign magical traditions had been absorbed in one of the most famous Jewish books of magic from late antiquity. When commenting the, the materia magica from the recipe in Sefer Arazim, I noted the Greek origin of the term psuchotron, which corresponds to the Greek psuchoforum documented in two spells from the Greek magical papyri and in, the, and in a Roman defixio. Besides the use of this specific technical term, these four magical texts, respe respectively from the Jewish, Greco-Egyptian and Roman words, exhibit several analogies also in the scope of the magical procedure and in the ritual performance. Both the spells in the Greek magical papyri, source 3 and 4 in the handout, 
are not explicitly aimed at making a victim an insomnia. The first, uh, the first is in fact a spell for silencing people, bringing people into subjection and inhibiting people. And the second represents a restraining right for anything that works even on chariots and which also causes sickness. However, both these Greek-Egyptian spells bear a marked aggressive character and like the recipe in Sefer Arazim, represent incantations aimed at gaining power over a certain individual. As noted, the recipe in Sefer Arazim and the two spells from the magical papyri share the ritual procedure of inscribing a lead lamella from the cold water pipe. It is noteworthy that in both the Jewish and Greek Egyptian sources, the inscribed lamella has to be inserted into a dead body, a person who died prematurely in the Greek Egyptian recipe, and a dog in the Jewish incantation. The aggressive spell preserved in the Roman defictio is a 4th century Finnish product, that is, a cursed tablet that was actually used during the magical act, probably written by a charioter or by someone acquainted with circus magic. And you have the relevant passages of uh, this defictio in the handout uh, on point five. The defictio aims at provoking a cruel death for a certain Cardelus son of Fulgentia, most likely a rival charioter of the user. And we read in, uh, in the text, Cardelus son of Fulgentia, so that you make possible that he is punished and die of a bad death within five days. Again, the magical procedure described in the defictio does not refer to insomnia, yet, as with uh, the uh, recipe in Sefer Arazim, it mentions that the victim is bound and handed over to the non-human entities that are coerced to harm him. And I quote from the text, like we deliver to you this impious outlaw and damned Cardelos, son of Fulgentia, bound, bound together, bound below, so that together you, so, uh, so that together you fasten him, hold him, and deliver him to the god of the underworld in the house of Tartarus of the Inferno, the impious outlaw and miserable Cardelos, son of Fulgentia. <coughs> the will to magically and fatally bind the victim is emphasized by a detail from the picture carved on the tablet, which shows a, a human figure tied with ropes. In my view, the figure portrays Cardelos, the victim of the spell, and the black circle in his torso might represent his heart, fatally performed by two ropes that seem to be serpents with the head of a dog. In the Jewish world, the, Babylon the Babylonian incantation bowls, which I will discuss uh, soon, uh, sometimes preserve images portraying demonic and human figures bound, uh, uh, um, bound with chains and shackles, possibly implying that they are prevented from attacking the users of the bowl. And you have some examples on uh, this slide. Some of these human figures uh, depicted upon the bowls might even represent uh, the cursed magician who becomes the victim in counter spells. A published bowl uh, in Aramaic uh, includes the drawing of a human figure which might be bound by a serpent with an iconography similar to that, to that observed in the Roman defictio. Another analogy between the oneric aggressive recipe in Sefer Arazim and the Roman defictio concerns the explicit will to harm the entire person of the victim. While the Greek text mostly refers to the physical body of the victim, bones, marrow, nerves, flesh, adopting only two terms for the immaterial bo body of the victim, such as soul and vigor, the Hebrew recipe entirely considers the spiritual body of the victim, life, soul, and spirit. The linguistic and ritualistic similarities between the recipe in Sefer Arazim and the Greco-Egyptian or Greco-Roman magical text discussed so far suggest, in my view, that the Jewish incantation was originally adapted from a non-Jewish spell expunged of the most explicit foreign elements. 
In light of the many Greco-Egyptian and Greco-Roman aggressive spells for causing insomnia or producing wakefulness, documented, for instance, in the corp corpus of the magical papyri, but also in the castoi by the third century author Julius Africanus, it is actually very plausible that part of this rich foreign tradition had been absorbed during late antiquity in the Jewish milieu of oneric magic. In the brief time that remains, I wish to discuss two more examples of oneric aggressive magic preserved among the Babylonian incantation bowls. The first example that I will present is Jewish, the second non-Jewish. The corpus of the Babylonian incantation bowls consists of about 2,000 clay bowls produced by Jewish, Christian, Mandean and Zoroastrian communities of Sasanian Babylonia between the 5th and 8th centuries of the Common Era. The spells inscribed upon the bowls, which are probably transmitted both orally and textually, are generally a protopaic, aimed at preserving and restoring the health and welfare of the user against demons and the evil eye. Since good health also meant restoring sleep and good dreams, the Babylonian incantation bowls were often used to keep insomnia and nightmares away from the user. By stopping nocturnal demonic attacks, either provoked by demons, the dead, and the living, the sorcerer or an enemy. A few bowls exhibiting an explicit aggressive character and intended to harm another human also attest to the use of oneric aggressive techniques. The first Babylonian incantation bowl that I would like to present, which is source six in the handout, and you can see on this slide, belongs to the collection of the British Museum and is written in Jewish Babylonian Aramaic, thus attesting to techniques of oneric aggressive magic among the Jews. The bowl, commissioned by a certain Mahlafa son of Bachiton, um, aimed at nullifying the spell of which he and his family were the victims. In particular, Mahlafa wanted to damage his enemy a certain Marzutra son of Uthmai, by sending back upon him all the evil charms that he and his family received. And I quote from the bowl. And everything that was sent against him, Mahlafa son of Bashiton, that they may be sent against Marzutra son of Uthmai, may they be returned against him and against his heirs and inheritance. According to the incantation, Maklafa sends back upon the sender a series of evil entities with the intention of harming him. Among other commands, the evil creatures are instructed to cause certain sleep disorders in Marzutra until he dies. As we read, and send against the Marzutra son of Uchmai, your maid servants and your jailers and your masters and your messengers, May you release dogs from leashes and cubs from chains. May they inflame him and burn him and heat him up and frighten him. And may they subdue him. And may they not give sleep to his eyes and not give him rest in his body, in his dreams and in his visions. And may they terminate his life and not give him life. Insomnia and nightmares are used in this bowl to threaten and bewitch a victim. According to the bowl, the user is aware that by distorting the victim's sleeping, dreaming faculties, he will be able to physically exhaust him until his death. In particular, the forecast of the victim's death might imply the belief that prolonged and pathological insomnia might lead to death. In the bowl, seeing an avid dream is regarded as an indication of a course. Alongside other illnesses, such as fever, shivering, and headache, insomnia and nightmares play an essential role in the course that it is to be returned to the sender, suggesting, at, this, at least in this specific case, the association of witchcraft with oneric phenomena in a similar manner to that uh, argued, to that argued for the Akkadic anti-witchcraft series Maklu. The bowl presents also some linguistic and ritualistic analogies with the recipe for causing insomnia from Sefer al-Azim. The expression and may 
they not give sleep to his eyes, is analogous, in fact, to the passage in Sefer Azim, and do not give sleep to his eyelids. Furthermore, both texts create a figurative image of the insomniac characterized by animal confusion and agitation. Sefer Arazim employs the symbolic image of a dog's head and the metaphor of a barking, do barking dog to refer to the troubled mind of the insomniac, while the bowl describes the victim as assaulted and subdued with fire by dogs and wild animals. The second bowl that I wish to discuss and which represents our last example of phoneric magic <coughs> is written in Mandaic, thus attesting to a non-Jewish tradition. And it is source seven in the handout, as you can see it here. The bowl, composed of two independent incantations, registers the nightmare dreamt by the user, Bashrenai daughter of Shafafrid, in which, in which she is violently bound and tortured. And I read from the poem. The signs that I, Bashrinai, saw in my dream, it seemed I was strapped and doubly strapped, strapped with straps of iron and chained with chains of lead, indeed thrown face down beneath a bed of iron, copper and lead, and I was filled with the water of Sahras, and my head was placed upon the skulls of lilies. On the basis of a parallel found in a later Mandaic text, Dr. James Nathan Ford argues that the dream report preserved in the bowl was not an actual dream, but a once well-known magical motif. Since the bowl mentions the bed and pillow of the user and expresses the request that the user receives pleasant dreams while her hater, the Pituarta demon, is shown hateful dreams, it might be considered considered an oneric aggressive incantation that adopts the, a conventional magical motifs to depict and reverse the sleep impairment of the user victim. The vivid images used in the dream report correspond in part to the description of the victim bound by angels with iron chains and copper rods in Sefer Arazim, and the victim punished on a bed of punishment and condemned to a bad death in the Roman Defizio. So to conclude, in this lecture I presented a selection of late antique and medieval sources related to sleep and dreams, and in particular to specific behaviors that I associated to oneric aggressive magic. The Jewish sources that I have examined come from different geographical areas, from Palestine, Egypt, and Babylonia, thus reflecting different shades of Jewish culture. Yet they all mirror the great attention paid by late antique Jews, Jews to sleeping and dreaming phenomena, highlighting their fear that an evil dream may draw misfortune to the dreamer and sleeplessness might even lead to death. Late antique Jews usually explain the occurrence of go good or evil dreams and lack of sleep as a result of divine or demonic attacks. The ancient beliefs that demons and other non-human beings were in charge of sleep and dreams gave rise to various magical rituals aimed at controlling and affecting the sleep of a third person with the aid of a demonic angelic assistant. Therefore, spells for sending evil dreams or causing insomnia in a chosen victim were commonly used by Jews in late antiquity for different purposes. Equally, people turned to magicians in order to prevent demons from appearing in their dreams or troubling their sleep and to protect themselves, themselves from possible oneric aggressive incantations perpetrated to their detriment by a sorcerer or an enemy. In this lecture, I compared the Jewish sources to a selection of coeval non-Jewish texts, a few spells from the Greek magical papyri, a Roman defixio, and a Mandean incantation bow. <coughs> especially when studying natural psychophysical, uh, psychophysical phenomena, such as dreaming and sleeping, it is very difficult to establish whether a certain behavior was practiced cross-culturally due to an actual historical con contact and exchange between two or more cultures, or whether it has to be explained as a spontaneous and casual regeneration of the phenomenon among different contexts. Yet, 
some of the functionalistic, ritualistic, and even linguistic analogies detected between the Jewish and non-Jewish oneric techniques presented in this lecture, seem to suggest, at least to a certain extent, the circulation of a specific magical knowledge related to sleep and dreams among the different Near East, Eastern and Mediterranean cultures during late antiquity. Of course, that of oneric aggressive magic is only one of the many examples of how magical and esoteric traditions are transmitted, adapted, and changed in the encounter between cultures. 